Hello there, girls, boys, and as always, others. Welcome to the second part of the review of the end of year exam. This part, we're going to be having a look at section B, the longer answer questions. If you've not yet had a look at section A, the questions that you did on Edmodo, please do go and check that out. So here we go, section B. Okey so let's have a look. Now we've seen actually the first part of this question in section A. This is a continuation and a lot of that will happen in this paper. A lot of these things we have already seen the start of in section A and they are now continued in this section B. Briefly explain why an unbalanced chemical equation cannot fully describe a reaction. Now if you've been quite vague, if you've used the words amounts, I've probably not given you the mark here. What we need is the concept that whatever there is on the left hand side, there must also be the same on the right hand side. So you could say uh, same number of atoms or elements, that would be a great way to put it. Some of the people just said, because if it doesn't, it does not obey the law of conservation of mass. And that's a great way to look at it as well. So this question was worth one mark. Now in ExamNet, for some strange reason, uh, it did revert to an older version of the paper that I'd written. So this was only worth one mark, but your question paper might have said that it's worth two marks. Sorry about that. I'm not entirely sure what happened there. Um, we're still getting used to the, this technology, so uh, my bad. Uh, anyway. Uh, briefly explain why an unbalanced chemical reaction cannot fully describe a reaction. Okay. Because it would not follow the law of conservation of mass. Although there are other ways of saying that. So for example, For example, saying that there's a different number of atoms on each side of the equation um, or that it appears that it has gained mass or gained atoms, something along those lines. If you're not too sure why you got those marks, uh, feel free to ask me now, copy and paste it. If you are watching this on webinar, copy and paste your answer into the questions and I can give you some uh, further advice on that or just pop it to my email address. Uh, you know how to get to me there. Question two, I'm sorry, question two is a little bit naughty. It is calculating the volume of gases, which we were supposed to get time to review a little bit before the exam, um, but we got distracted with other things, so we didn't do it. So it's a little bit cheeky of me leaving this in. But actually, a few of you got this right. So it was worth seeing how people coped with it. Um, and it is clearly something that we will need to practice again next year. But that's fine. That's often the case with calculations, to be fair. So key information it's given us in the question. We've got 150 kilograms of chlorine gas at room temperature and pressure. The volume of one mole of any gas at room temperature and pressure is 24 decimeter cubed. So let's just make a note of one mole equals 24 decimeter cubed. Just to remind us, that's all that that bit says there and it's told us the relative formula mass for cl2 is 71 and we've got a mass of a hundred and fifty kilograms okay so what we need to do is we know what one mole would take up so we need to work out how many moles of chlorine we've actually got present now for those of you who did the stretch and challenge task you probably will be able to do this most people might not though uh, so what we need to do is link the idea of relative form of mass with mass and moles the way that we do that is mr mole mass i'll explain that again properly next year with a little pretty picture. Um, I'll talk about that another time. So that's our formula triangle. To get moles, we do mass divided by relative formula mass. Now this mass is in kilograms. When we are dealing with moles, we do tend to convert first to grams just because it makes it a little bit easier. 150 kilograms is the same as 150,000 grams. You just times by a thousand there to get from here to here, times by a thousand. Okay, so moles equals mass divided by relative formula mass. The mass was 150,000. Relative formula mass 
was 71, which is going to equal 2112.67606. That's an awful number to deal with, isn't it? Um, this is worth two marks, this question. Uh, if you got the answer right on the bottom line, you automatically got two marks. Um, <clears throat> if you didn't get two marks, uh, your first mark was for seeing that. Um, again, not many people got that, which is fair enough. Okay, so that's how many moles we've got. That weird number there is the number of moles, and we need to work out the volume that that number of moles actually takes up. Uh, so before we saw that one mole takes up 24 decimeter cubed, we've not got one mole, we've got 2,112.67606, blah, 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 on my calculator. Um, so let's just times that by 24. Okay, one mole equals 24 decimeters. So if we just times it by 24, it'll get us the volume for that. So times 24 equals equals 50704.2254. Whew. Um, has the question actually asked us to express it to any sort of significant figures? No, so you'd probably be fine leaving it like that. Um, I'm going to simplify that. Let's just call that. That'll do. Okay, I've just gone three significant figures there. If in doubt, go to three significant figures. OK, so, yeah, that, that was a little bit cheeky of me to leave that in there. Um, but some of you can do it already, which is really very impressive. So that's awesome. And well done to those of you who gave it a really flipping good go anyway, even though you weren't unsure. That's awesome because that is science. OK, giving it a go, even if you're not entirely sure what's going to happen. Determination. Love it. Good on you. Question three was extremely well answered. Quite a lot of people, uh, I'd say over 50% of you got four out of four on that, which is absolutely brilliant. Well done there. Uh, so basically you're talking about any combustion pollutant really. Uh, so it says here, name two products of burning coal that has an effect on the environment, not forgetting that coal is a type of fuel. So we are looking for combustion pollutants whether it be complete or incomplete or there because of just impurities that are just there. Uh, and then what impact does each of these products have on the environment? So basically you get one mark for a chemical, the second mark for what it does, so uh, its effect, third mark for another chemical, fourth mark for the effect of that one. It's pretty straightforward. And honestly, you were all really good at this. The ones that we were looking for, I'll just write out very quickly now. So those are the main three ones there. Um, I was also allowed to accept uh, nitrogen oxides. So nitrogen oxides uh, can cause smog or they can also contribute towards acid rain as well. Some people went for methane. Methane is not a combustion pollutant. Uh, in fact, it's actually a fuel. So methane would not be allowed in this case. We know it's a greenhouse gas as well, uh, four times as potent as some of the other greenhouse gases, but it's not a waste product of this combustion reaction. So I wasn't allowed to accept that. The answers on the screen are the ones that we were really looking for there. Again, if you have any additional ones that you want to query, please do pop that in the questions or in the comments or email them directly to me. OK, question four, this flipping graph again. It was in the other one. It was in section A, it's in section B, it's everywhere. Uh, right, OK, so what have we got going on here? We've got percentage of carbon dioxide on the left hand side so it started really high and it's got lower and lower and lower on our x-axis along the bottom we've got time in millions of years ago so actually uh past to present kind of like that uh, and then you know what let's just finish labeling this high percentage low percentage just to get you thinking about it uh, and what's it actually asking us to do? Describe how percentage of carbon dioxide has changed in the last 4,500 million years. Okay, and how many marks is this worth? This is worth two marks. Massive piece of advice for you here, exam technique. If you have a question, whether it be explain or describe, about a graph, what you have to do is look how many marks it's worth and then divide that graph into that many sections. 
So this graph is worth two marks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide it into two sections where there seem to be kind of two different patterns happening. Now in this one here, at the start, it seems like quite a steep line. So I'm going to kind of do a little bit of a break there. And I'm going to label this side one and this side two. You don't have to label it one and two. You could say A or B. You could go X, Y. You could even just go from 3,500 years to 4,500 years ago. It was like this. Uh, after that time, it was like this. That's fine too. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get both marks for being able to describe section one of the graph and section two of the graph. Most people in this question did get one mark because they just had a nice sort of generic trend being the quantity of carbon dioxide has decreased over time. Yeah, that's fine. That's worth one mark. To get two marks, we need to describe each section independently. So something along the lines of, and what you can do is go in section one. You've already sketched section one above, so that'll do. Uh, in section one, the percentage of CO2 decreases rapidly. Now, since this is a describe question, that's all that we kind of have to do. So describing is just, is just describing what the line looks like or like what the pattern is. If it was asking for explain, it would want you to give the reason why that pattern was that shape. For example, um, the carbon dioxide decreased rapidly because, and it's the because bit which is the explain, um, lots of the carbon dioxide was sequestered into water and rocks. Okay, for a describe, you do not need to give the reasoning. Okay, so that first bit there, that is worth one mark. The second bit is for describing the second section. So in section two, the percentage of CO2 is still decreasing, but much more slowly than it was before. There we go, an answer a bit like that. As this is pre-recorded, I can't see any comments that's coming through now. If I am playing this through webinar, obviously I can pause it, but as this is pre-recorded, um, I can guarantee a lot of you right now are asking, but miss, is it okay to actually write on the graph and do all these funny little labels that you've done? Yes, dear Lord, yes, okay? That is gonna make it, first off, more, clear what you are actually on about but equally for me as an examiner i have been examining with aqa for quite some time now um it actually makes it easier for me to mark and if it's easier for me to mark you're more likely to get the marks you deserve cheeky tip okay okay question five this is a reacting masses calculation I used to hate these damn things because I was rubbish at them. Um, but actually, the more you practice them, they're so easy when you get into them. Okay, so just keep practice, practice, practice. If you need more of these, I've got like literally folders of these things, um, both real paper folders and digital folders as well on the computer. So uh, if you want more, please just ask for them. Okay, let's have a look. Uh, so step number one always check that these are balanced. So I'm just going to re-sketch out the equation nice and quickly there. FeSO4 plus H2. One iron on the left-hand side, one iron on the right-hand side. Two hydrogens on the left, two hydrogens on the right, that's fine. Uh, one sulfur on the left, one sulfur on the right, that's fine. Four oxygens, four oxygens, great. Already balanced, sorted. I don't have to do any balancing there. That's great, that saves me a bit of fuss. Uh, let's highlight the important bits from the question. Calculate the mass of iron sulfate, that's this thing. So that's the thing that I'm trying to work out. Uh, that can be obtained from four grams of iron. So there's the iron, and I've got four grams of it. And they've actually given us here the relative formula, uh, relative atomic masses of them anyway, so I don't even have to double check with the periodic table. So just to make things a little bit easier for me, I am just going to rub out the bits that I don't need. So there we go, that just makes the working space a bit less bit less cluttered. Okay, the next thing that we do with these is work out the relative formula masses of each of those things. Relative formula mass of iron uh, is just there is 56. So I will just go Fe equals 56. The relative formula mass of FeSO4 
ball. Whew, that's a little bit cheekier, isn't it? Uh, so the FE bit is 56. Add sulfur is 32. Add the oxygen is 16, but there's the little four there, which means there's four lots of it. Now, the four lots are just to that one element to the left of it. Okay, so only the oxygen is times by the four. Whack all that into a calculator, what will I get? That will equal 152. Now, this calculation, like all the other calculations in chemistry, if you automatically get the answer correct on the bottom line, uh, you automatically get the four marks or five marks, three marks, whatever number of marks it's worth. If you don't, your teacher has to go back or the examiner has to go back and look at everything you have done. So some of you just wrote the answer down straight away. Um, some of you actually said, oh, I've got the workings, but on a piece of paper, fine, great. You could have sent those to me as well. That would have been nice to see, um, but that's fine. Some of you who I know struggled with these calculations just had the answer right on the bottom line with no stages of calculations. Hmm, that makes me suspicious, very suspicious. Anyway, let's crack on with the calculation. For the first mark, uh, for if you didn't get all the way down to the answers, the first mark was for seeing 56 and 152. Okay, so if I have 56 of iron, I'm going to get 152 of the iron sulfate. The question actually asked about four grams of iron. So what I need to do is I need to get this left hand side equaling four. Easiest way to do that is to get it down to one and then times it back up again to four. So to get 56 to equal one, I'm going to do 56 divided by 56 equals one. Uh, the units were grams, so I'm just going to leave that as grams as well. Whatever I do to one side, I have to do to the other. So I'm going to do 152 divided by 56 equals 2.714285 blah, 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 blah. Uh, and all that I'm going to do is I'm just going to leave that on my screen, okay? Because then I won't get any rounding errors there. Uh, grams as well. The question originally said we've got four grams of the iron, so I'm just going to times this side by four to get four grams. Whatever I do to one side, I must do to the other. So that 2.7 blah, 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 also multiplied by four equals this, uh, equals 10.8571429 blah, 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 which has it given me any significant figures to go for? No, it hasn't. Uh, so I'm going to just go to three. So 10.9 grams and that'll do it. OK, so three marks for if you had 10.9 grams or even uh, 10.85, blah, 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 whatever. OK, so if you didn't get full marks there, it might have been that I've seen you've done a little bit of those stages of the calculations um, and been able to give you some marks there. Again, if you need a bit more explanation of that, please do get in touch or just replay what I've just done on this video, but a bit slower because I do appreciate that quite quickly. And again, if you want more practice of these, let me know. I got thousands of the damn things. <laughs> So uh, question six, 6A and 6B um, were pretty disappointing, actually, but not many people did particularly well on them. But actually, um, 6A in particular was a little bit odd. Uh, it was from a real GCSE exam, from a past paper, and it's quite a, kind of strange where the marks come from. Um, so let's go, 6A. Uh, Titan is a moon of the planet Saturn. I told you they always put it in weird contexts, didn't I? I said like Venus or something like that for one example that we did in lesson. This one's Titan, a moon of the planet Saturn. We've not, never done about moons of Saturn, whatever. Uh, but what we have done is percentage of gases. Aha. So percentage of gas in the atmosphere, it's got nitrogen at 98.4. That's a fair bit of nitrogen. Uh, not that nitrogen particularly does anything. Most of our atmosphere at the minute is about 80% nitrogen and it's what we call quite inert. It doesn't really do an awful lot. So having that much nitrogen 
doesn't really matter in the nicest possible way. Uh, methane, 1.4. Now, methane, we do know, is a greenhouse gas, so that's not going to be great for the warmth of the planet. Uh, well, no, it will be. It'll be too good for the warmth of the planet, uh, assuming it has a nose end layer to keep the heat in, and 0 0.2 of other gases. Okay. Some scientists think that living organisms could have evolved on Titan. Using table three, again, sorry, some of you said it was table one, table three. That's my fault. I don't know why ExamNet didn't uh, accept my changes, but it didn't. Urgh, never mind. Uh, why these organisms could not have evolved the same way that life is thought to have evolved on Earth. Okay, so evolution of the atmosphere, it was something like the second lesson that we did, maybe even the first lesson that we did, and we did the little storyboard, okay, and we saw on that that actually life on Earth for ages had nothing to do with animals, okay, definitely nothing to do with humans for the longest time. Before the animals, there were plants, okay, plants have existed for a significantly long time, so what do the plants need? So for life to have evolved in the same way as it did on Earth, they would need to have had plants. And those plants would have needed to have carbon dioxide to do photosynthesis. So this question is worth two marks. Now, I appreciate it said three on your version. Again, examiner. Um, so what we are looking for is, first off, a difference. And second off, why that would be an issue. So first off, big difference. You could say that there's no or that there's very, very little carbon dioxide. Uh, I was accepting or oxygen as well, actually, to be fair. So if there's no oxygen present, animals and plants can't do respiration. But that wasn't necessarily what we were looking for. It's not the named process that we're looking for. The named process that we were looking for is photosynthesis. So plants can't be produced, can't exist. They can't do photosynthesis because the carbon dioxide isn't present and therefore they can't make oxygen for other organisms to respire. Okay, so two main marks that we're looking for there. First off, a difference, the main difference being uh, no carbon dioxide. And the second mark for the reason why that's an issue, because then the plants can't exist because plants can't do photosynthesis without carbon dioxide. Bit of a strange question, I appreciate. Um, but yeah, evolution of the atmosphere, that's what that question was about. 6b. Uh, Saturn has got other moons. Cool. Hasn't Saturn got like the most number of moons in the solar system? Like 17 or something like that? I don't know. If you're into your planets, let me know. Uh, the other moons of Saturn have no atmosphere. Oh, Titan is warmer than the other moons of Saturn because its atmosphere contains greenhouse gases mentioned that a second ago didn't I methane oh yeah <laughs> methane explain how this greenhouse explain explain how this greenhouse gas keeps Titan warmer than the other moons of Saturn so it basically wants you to describe the greenhouse effect uh the answers that we got for that a lot of you lot put for this were pretty disappointing actually especially considering it was worth three marks lots of you just said it's got a greenhouse gas so it traps the heat in i mean yeah you're right uh you probably got one mark for that but it's a bit of a feeble answer for three marks isn't it come on <sighs> never mind we live and learn okay that's part of this okay celebrate our successes but learn from our mistakes okay so the greenhouse effect so we had that little silly kind of memory thing to help you, in theory, <laughs> try to remember this. Uh, short, ugly, violet always really irritates Lucy. Short, ugly, violet always really irritates Lucy. In temper tantrums, if you could be bothered to include that as well. So the short bit stood for short. So short waves of radiation, not just heat or light, okay? Lots of you were writing about heat and light. It's not good enough, okay? It's not heat and light that we're getting. It's short waves of radiation, the shorter waves being ultraviolet. They come towards the Earth, they are absorbed and then re-emitted as 
infrared radiation, which is a longer wavelength. And that is sort of a longer wavelength. And then that, the sort of in temper tantrums, increases temperature because it's trapped by the greenhouse gas, or we said CO2 in our specific example. So how do we get from that sort of like, like little memory thing to an actual answer there? So let's start with um, short wave radiation, which is UV, comes from the sun. It is then absorbed it is absorbed uh, by the earth or the atmosphere. It is then re-emitted as infrared radiation, IR for short, uh, which is longer wave radiation. And then the last bit, the in temper tantrums, uh, is that it's trapped increased temperature is trapped by the specific greenhouse gas in this question uh, it's talking about methane so trapped by methane so temperature increases okay so where are the marks actually from uh we've got the idea of short wave coming from the sun is worth your first mark the second mark is the idea that it's re-emitted as infrared radiation that is the second mark and it being trapped by the methane is the third mark so if you say like the heat is trapped by the methane i was allowed to give you that third mark but only the third mark okay for the first and second you needed to identify the two types of radiation that were present there so uv or short wave you didn't necessarily have to put both and then for the second mark infrared radiation or longer wave again you didn't have to say ir and longer you just had to say one or the other okay or both if you wanted to cover your own backside okay not many people got full marks on that for those of you who did get full marks on that you are godlike, amazing, well done. Everyone else, first problem is recognizing that's what the question's after. Second problem is this idea of remembering the different types of radiation, okay? So please make sure you, if I give you one of those sort of silly, like remembering systems, it's for a reason, okay? This came up on last year's exam and up and down the country, people just messed it up, okay? It's very important we get that right because it's very likely to keep coming up on exams until people do get it right. OK, so tip, make sure you learn that one. OK, then, girls, boys and others, that is it. That is section B done and section A done in a previous video. Please make sure you have a look through your answers and please do keep them somewhere safe. OK, these types of questions are very common on the real exams. OK, now, as yet, we don't really know what's going to happen with exams. There are all sorts of different thoughts going on about what might actually go on with them. But whatever happens with them, this sort of stuff will probably be asked. OK, so it is very important you keep your notes somewhere safe. By now, you should have all received uh, your detailed feedback. It's coming to you via email. If you have not got it yet, please do give me a shout and I'll make sure I resend that out to you. That is all for now, ladies, gents, girls, boys and others. Uh, and that is it for the year. We are done. It is the summer holidays. Woo! Um, have a, a lovely summer break, everyone. You have totally earned it. This has been a crazy, crazy, I was going to say half term, but uh, this has been a crazy half year. Um, thank you so much uh, for staying with me, sticking with me uh, and doing as much as you can on this course. It has been lovely teaching you uh, and getting to know you, even though it's just been through your little comments. Um, <laughs> And I will apologise in advance. Uh, I am terrible for matching faces and names. So if I see you in September and you just start talking to me, my brain will go, who is this person? And then you'll say your name. I'll be like, oh, yeah. Blah, 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 blah. That's just the way my brain works. Please don't take it personally. Um, as I say, I've had a lovely time teaching you lot. Uh, and I can't wait, can't wait to actually see you all properly in September. Fingers crossed. Touch wood. <sighs> 
Have a lovely summer. Bye-bye.